I want to welcome everybody here today. We've been going through some interesting um, series developments in this class, and today we're going to do a little retro look back because I just got the uh, Torah devotional. Um, this is the uncorrected proof. So this is one where it's it's not for sale yet, but it's getting close. And so it's almost here, and it is um, pretty, I'm pretty stoked about it. So I decided we've got a little bait and switch this morning in legal terminology. I told you I'd be teaching about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> this week. I'll do that next week. I am stoked to do that, by the way. There's some great word play and idea play that goes on there that you get when you read it in the Greek with a decent understanding. I won't claim to have a good one, but a decent understanding of the culture of the day, especially the rabbinical culture as it's uh, uh, relayed to us in some different sources. So I'm excited to do that. But today, in light of the fact that the Torah devotional book is just right around the corner, I thought that I would just give you some of my personal favorites out of the book. One or, yeah, one or two of these were ones that I tried out on you before. And uh, uh, I changed them up some for the book. You guys have been my guinea pigs for this. I'm deeply appreciative that you've let me teach some of this in the class to see what seems to strike a resonating chord and what falls flat. And so with that, we're going to march through some of my favorites. If you like them, be excited. When the book comes out, uh, Becky and I have already got a copy for all of you. And yours will be a hardbound copy. The, when you get them on Amazon, they're paperback. So uh, Baylor's publishing it paperback for everybody except y'all. But y'all get hardback. So that's the, the treat. So we've got the hardback coming for you, but it's still probably about a month from being out or so. So uh, as soon as we get them, I'll let you know, and we'll hand them out in here. Uh, so with that, are you ready? Like the rest of these devotionals, each one is in sections. So if you get bored with one, go to sleep, tell your neighbor, wake you up at the end for the next one. And you can just find the ones that speak to you that may have some use. Because we've got so many people, Dale Manor, for example, from Harding University, who digs Beth Shemesh. We've got so many people who have so many fingers deep into the true dirt of the Holy Land. The Haaretz is all in their fingers that I've tried to put some in that they might have some fun with, as well as the rest of you guys. So let's just see what's there. And if it's not for you, that's okay. These are small vignettes. So here's the first one of my personal favorites. Numbers, uh, there we go. Numbers 14.39. When Moses told these words, all the people of Israel... To all the people of Israel. The people mourned greatly. Now I don't know if you remember where in the Torah this fits. So let me tell you. In Numbers chapter 14, we have the story of, of the Israelites getting into the promised land. Uh, it actually starts in, verse, in chapter 13. If we go to the Elmo for one moment, we'll put it into a, a good context. Because there's a critical verse here. The Lord, and you'll see it's all capitals. This is the personal name of God. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. God wanted there to be no doubt he was giving it to the people of Israel. He didn't pull them out of Egypt to have them waste away in the wilderness. He pulled them with the promise of the land that he had promised to Abraham centuries before. So within that framework, Moses is told to send spies out. But the clear message is that God's giving the land. The people need to hear God. Now here's my question for you. If we go back to the PowerPoint, please. My question for you is this. 
where do you get your advice for life? To whom do you listen? I mean, if you understand the story and you know the backstory, what happened is they select 12 spies. The 12 spies go out. The 12 spies come back. They give a report. The land's phenomenal. It's flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. The people are massive. The cities are fortified. And, and, and uh, uh, while the food looks great and is huge, 10 of the 12 are petrified and advising against going in to do the conquering. So to whom do you listen? Well, the people did not listen to God. They did not listen to the two that came back and said, hey, by God's help we can do it. They listened to the ten that gave them the bad advice. And so my first suggestion is, if God tells you to do something, go ahead and do it. You don't need to wait for someone else to tell you why God is wrong. That's strike one. And then if you're going to get counsel from other people, which the Proverbs say is a good thing to do, you want your counsel to come from people of faith, not people of fear. So if you're listening and you've got the people of faith who are saying to you, we can do this through God, Listen to them and take their advice as opposed to those who say, doesn't matter if God's on our side or not, we're all going to get killed. Now, I'm not saying be foolish in the choices you make in life, but recognize the strength of counsel from those who follow God and live faithfully. Recognize the inherent difficulties of counsel from those who do not faithfully follow or know God. So within the framework of that, we'll all get killed. Strike two, the people listened to the wrong folks again. They didn't listen to God, strike one. They didn't listen to the faithful, strike two. And so Moses tells them all. He says, look, as a result, you're not going in. And at that point, when Moses says any invasion now is doomed, what do the people do? A good number of them say, well, we'll just go in then. If God's that ticked off about it, we'll just go on in. Well, that's strike three. Because God said don't at that point. Moses said don't. The people go in, the people get annihilated. So here's the devotional thought for the day on that devotional passage. You can go a lot of places to get your advice. You can go to psychics. I think it's like 10 bucks at a lot of these places. I've seen it from the street. And I've got to admit, there's part of me that wants to shell out 10 bucks just to go see the charlatan that's there. <laughs> you can turn on the... Uh, new, uh, you roll up, open the newspapers or turn on the computer and you can find your horoscopes as if the cosmic alignment of the stars are going to tell you what life is. By the way, did you know that your brain suffers from something called confirmation bias where you have a tendency to interpret things to fit what you already believe? That's why so many people look at horoscopes and say, I mean, this is exactly what I was going through. It's confirmation bias. It's scientific. Read about it. You can, you can find every kind of self-help book there is in the world, and there are plenty of them. <laughs> and if all else fails, there's always someone who's willing to tell you exactly what you need to do with your life. But my question to you is, to whom do you listen? My hope is we'll listen to the Word of God, either as it's written directly or as godly people have given us counsel with it. You with me? So that's one day, one of my favorites. But let's take a moment. Thank you. Well, don't thank me. Thank the Lord. Let's take a moment and let's pray about this. Father, it is our prayer that you will give us ears to hear you. 
directly through your word, but also through the godly counsel of other people. And Father, as we hear you, please give us the courage and the strength and the heart to obey. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, next one. Wake up if you didn't like that one. It's time for another one. This is one of my favorites. He also made the robe of the ephod woven. I, do any of y'all have this passage memorized? It's typically not listed as favorite verse of the Bible, but I didn't know. He also made the robe of the ephod woven all of blue. And the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linens. Now I got to tell you, I find this passage a bit scary. Seriously. Now, I'm not normally scared of garments. My daughters in their teenage years sometimes wore some things that scared me <laughs> for different reasons. But I'm not typically afraid of garments nor the making of garments. But this passage I find quite scary. Here, Moses' work is being spoken of. This is the work that God had dictated. God told them how to make the robes, the garment for the priests to wear as he ministered to Israel before the Lord. And the description is frightening to me in its detail. And consider who's talking here. We're in the Torah. The Torah is a collection of five books. Just one book earlier, one scroll earlier, in the scroll of Bareshit, in the scroll of Genesis, we read that in six days, God is responsible for a universe that we continue to try to understand 3,000 years post-Moses. We continue to try to understand the depths of this universe with quasars and, and nebulae and, 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 and solar systems and galaxies. This universe is so expansive. And then, I mean, scientists debate what's at the edge of the universe. Well, that's not even a real question to ask, they say. And the universe seems to be expanding into whatever is at the edge of the universe. Which is why it seems not to be a correct question. This is, this is the God who made all of that. This is the God who, who out of all of that grabbed this fireball we call the sun and set some big dirt clods around it, going in circles, one of which we call earth, and set this planet up to where it would have animals, and plant life, insects, amoebas. This God who did this vast, vast stuff, took time to explain how to make one priest's robe in such detail that he said double stitch around the collar so that it doesn't tear when he takes it on and off. And then with an artistic flair of beauty, Put some pomegranates in these colors around the hem so it looks dignified and beautiful. I mean, do we get this? Do we get that the God who is responsible for everything is the God who can mow the grass with cuticle snippers? <laughs> Jesus said it this way. He told his followers... Don't worry about your life when you have entrusted it to God. 
He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows the number of hairs on your head, which for some people is more challenging than others. But this is the God who's not only great and amazing, this is the God who is detailed and focused on you and on me. So in the midst of this life, with all of the turbulent waves and crises and problems and difficulties and challenges, the feelings of inadequacy, the wondering of, does God care about me? Have I muffed it up so much that he doesn't anymore? Or am I just too insignificant for him to care? After all, doesn't he have a lot more significant things to do? I mean, he's got this universe to run. Remember, our detailed God has not forgotten about us. We just need to see that and trust in him for that. So would you pray with me on this, please? Father, we do pray for eyes to see you. To see you in your grandeur, but to see you caring about our individual lives. To see you seeking us out in relationship. And Father, would you give us faith to trust you in that walk. We pray in your most holy name, amen. Okay, third devotional, new start. I love this one. This is like truly one of my favorite passages in the Bible. But Judah's firstborn, Ur. You know, having lived in Lubbock, home of the mighty Red Raiders, who beat the University of Houston like a drum yesterday. <laughs> Not that I was watching. We used to think Ur was a pretty important fella because a lot of people would pepper their speech with him. Well, Ur, I got to tell you, Ur, exactly Ur, what I mean here. Um, different Ur. <laughs> Judah's firstborn Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord put him to death. That's it. That's the passage. You want to read more about her? You ain't going to do it. There ain't no more about him. That's it. Love that passage. Love that passage. Why? Well, not because of her. I'm sure him and his wasn't happy about dying. I'm sure his mom and dad weren't too pleased over it either. Probably had some loved ones that were mourning. I don't mean to make light of any of that. That's not the part of the passage I like. I like the part that's right here at the beginning. Because it says nobody fools God. See, God's not blind to any of those skeletons you've got in your closet. God's not blind to who you really are. So don't think you've pulled one over on him. Here's why I get that from the passage. But Judah's firstborn Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Ur. Here's the Hebrew. Ur. It's from the Hebrew verb to blind. Usually found in the PL form, I believe, to make someone blind. To cause something to be blind. Ur, blind, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Now, wicked is from the Hebrew word ra. Well, actually, here it is ra. It's, it's ra. But the verb, it's evil. And if you look really careful, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to figure out what happened here. Look at the word er in Hebrew. It's got, it looks like they're doing the YMCA. And then it looks like to the left of that, we've got, it's an, an a, a R sound, but it, it looks like 
half a box with a rounded corner. You with me? Okay, that's the word, the name, er, that's to blind. Now, if you look on the right side, we say ra in Hebrew because it's got a different vowel sound to it, but it's the same two letters. They're just flipped. So on the right, you've got half a box, and next to it, you've got the Y-M-C-A-I-N. You see it? So here's what this really is saying to us. Judah's firstborn, Ur, thought he could blind God to who he was and blind others. And maybe he could pretend to be something he wasn't. But God saw him the right way. He saw that his name wasn't really one who blinds, but it was an evil one. And it just flips the letters of his name around. We find that a lot in the Pentateuch where the, 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 you find it with Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord and Noah in favor or just flip-flopped letters. And you'll find that used as a, as a technique a lot in, in the Pentateuch. But here what he's got is he's saying, hey, he may have pretended his name was blinding people, but God saw him for who he really was. God spelled his name correctly to his character. Nobody fools God. God is not blind to who we really are. So what does that mean? Are we all destined for death? Absent God's forgiveness? Yes. But at least in this passage, it's telling me we need to be honest with God. Don't pretend to be something you're not. He's really not fooled. Don't think for a moment you can blind him. He knows the right way to spell your name. He knows the way to spell it that's really a reflection of your character and who you are. And that's something that I can pray for in my life. I want to pray for honesty with God, which built in means confession of sin and inadequacy. So would you join me in that prayer? Father, with humility of spirit, we come before you and confess ourselves sinful. We have pride. We have haughtiness. We have selfishness. Envy, jealousy. Desires that are not godly, that ooze out in all ways in our lives. Father, we wish we were holy before you of our own accord where we could just embrace you, one holy being to another, but we're not. We need your holy touch, Father. We need you to make us holy. We are not holy on our own. We regret it, we confess it, and we pray for your forgiveness. Through your atoning sacrifice, we pray these things. Amen. Okay, next one. Those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tent of meeting toward the sunrise, were Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons, guarding the sanctuary itself to protect the people of Israel. Goran has to leave early. I did not introduce you all to Goran. Goran is from Zagreb, Croatia, and he is translating the Bible into modern Croatian right now. Pray for Goran. God bless you. I can give you more info about that later, but uh, it's a really cool project that he and the Bible Institute in Zagreb are doing. Um, okay. Now, I really like this passage, too. I mean, ultimately, I didn't pick any that I don't like. I think once or twice I did, but not for y'all. Once or twice I did just because I thought, I don't like this, but I got to do this. It's in here anyway. This is one I really like. And I hope you'll see why. Here's the question. Who's guarding whom? 
And here's the reason why. We live in a day and in a culture that in many ways is not unlike the ancient days and the ancient cultures. We live where those who merit special protection get special guarding. And kings and temples back in the ancient days would be protected. Temples not just because of the priests but often because of the valuables there. Kings because they're kings and leaders and they would keep their military around them, those that they trusted to protect them. Presidents today have secret service protection, as do others. Buckingham Palace and the Queen of England have those folks that wear those crazy Texas tech colors, the red and black, to protect them. And so you read a passage like that and you think, isn't that interesting? So God sticks Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons around to protect him. Huh -uh. This passage is exactly opposite of what every other culture I've ever studied expects. God doesn't need our protection. Those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tent of meeting toward the sunrise, were Moses, Aaron, and his sons guarding the sanctuary to protect the people of Israel. God doesn't need our protection. I mean, do you really think that the God who destroyed Pharaoh's army, that the God who brought the plagues, that the God who causes the earth to open up and swallow folks, Needs Aaron's sons standing guard to protect him? No. But if you remember the story of Nadab and Abihu and a few other stories, you understand you do not approach the holy God in an unholy fashion. Or you get zapped. The guard is set there to protect Israel because you know, though Israel had been told, no one enters the Holy of Holies save the high priest at a certain time of the year. Because they were told no one comes into this court except the priest to offer these sacrifices. Because they were told, here's the limit and here are the curtains and here's what's set here, there, and yon. They had those boundaries. And don't you know, if the Israelites were anything like us, that there had to be a couple who were going to say, i got to see what's in there. And I'm going to sneak in, and I'm going to check it out. Bam! You don't do that to a holy God. God teaches Israel some very harsh lessons that from a Christian perspective I see as a pre preferatory comment to help us understand the high, perfect degree of holiness required to be in the presence of God. I mean, even the prophet Isaiah comes into the presence of God. And he's petrified about it until God gets something from his altar and touches the tongue with an ember from the altar and purifies Isaiah. If God doesn't purify us, woe are we. And, 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 and Isaiah's passage happens in the year King Uzziah died. Remember Uzziah? He's the one who gets zapped with leprosy because he improperly seeks to offer to the Lord's service when he wasn't a priest and he had no business doing it. So I can see Isaiah being pretty concerned in that year when Isaiah finds himself in the presence of God and he says, I don't belong here. So God all along has been teaching his people. He is a holy God. He is not to be trifled with. For our own protection, we do not approach and deal with the holy God in some curiosity approach. 
We take serious who he is. We take serious his holiness. And we approach him through the means which he has set out for us. That's, that's the, the Christian message of we approach him through the atoning sacrifice. If you're following a Jewish calendar, Yossi told me in two days is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. From a Christian perspective, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, about 2,000 years ago. Something's got to be done about our sin before a holy God. So I want to pray for deliberateness in approaching God and not taking Him lightly. Father, would you move in our hearts to respect in awe your holiness, your character, your divine nature, your justice and your righteousness, which flow in the midst of your mercy, in the midst of your chesed, your, your, your covenant loyalty, your, your faithfulness to us. So that we approach you, Father, not on our own merit, but through humility and through the provisions that you have made for us. Yeah, I pray this in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Okay, next. Genesis 7, 24 through 8, 1. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. So last night we were fortunate. Many of you were fortunate. If not, you can get it on the internet. To hear Dr. Garfinkel, Professor Garfinkel, tell us about his dig at Kerbet Kayafa, which is... Um, a dig that he conducted with, with Michael and others for uh, six years? Seven. seven years. For seven years. And it's an amazing dig because he put to rest multiple layers of arguments that were put out there by skeptics and cynics to the idea that the Hebrew Bible contains real history especially in its older parts. And so his digs found evidence of an urban time, of the time of King David, dated by olive pits with radiocarbon dating from Oxford that set it firmly into that era in, a, in an urban setting that, that clearly seems to be one that's Judahite. It's, it doesn't seem to be Philistinian. It doesn't seem to be Canaanite. It's an amazing thing. And I loved hearing the lecture last night. It's one that, that I've been waiting to hear for a long time. I'd read about this as it was unfolding. And in fact, we'd spoken about it in this class when we did the Old Testament survey as the findings were coming out. But I can remember when I was in school and I was being trained in this stuff that there were certain aspects of the Bible that were being, we, we, we were looking at contrasting views. And this is one of those passages of contrasting views. There are some cynics and skeptics who look at this and say this is a vestige of a Hebraizing an old flood tradition that shows God in a very primitive light to be just, you know, kind of, a supersized human with human frailties. After all, the waters are on the earth for 150 days till God remembers. What a forgetful fella he can be at times, especially when it's raining. Now, the local cultures had flood accounts and flood stories that certainly showed the gods to be very human in some ways. 
If you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, you'll read that after the flood, there, there's nobody sacrificing to the gods, and the gods are hungry because they, they eat from the aroma of the sacrifices. So it's like, hurry up and sacrifice. And when, when the, the, the survivor does, the gods are buzzing around like bees almost eating. But that is not what this passage says, and that's not what the Hebrew Bible portrays the one true God to be. The waters prevailed on the earth 150 days, but God remembered Noah. So I was studying this passage back in the early 80s. And I came across a, a reference to a study on the Hebrew word that we've got here. It's the word zakar. The Hebrew word remembered. And uh, the study had been done by a professor named Brevard Childs. And I did not know Professor Childs. But um, I thought I wanted a copy of his book. Now, today you just get on the internet. You can find any book. But back in 1980-whatever, you didn't have that. So he had been an Ivy League professor. and So I called his seminary where he had been an Ivy League professor. I said, is he still on staff there? They said, no, he's retired. And I said, well, I'm trying to get a hold of him. I don't suppose you'd have his home number. They said, sure. <laughs> Please don't give my number out that freely. So they gave me his home number. So I called him at home. I said, Professor Childs. He said, yes. I said, my name's Mark Lanier. I'm a lawyer in Houston, Texas. He said, what did I do? <laughs> I said, you wrote a book that SCM published in 1961, a word study on Zakar. I said, I, I want a copy. Do you have an extra copy I could buy? And he said, it's, it's no good. He said, you don't want to buy it. He said, I was working on it, and I just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. He said, and then I found out some German student was doing his dissertation and was about to publish his dissertation on that word. So SEM told me I had to get it to print immediately. So I just rushed it off. He said, it's not, it's not as good as it should be. Get the German dissertation. And I said, I don't read German. He said, oh, then you need my book. And he graciously sent me a copy. And that was where I really got to understand that what this passage is doing is not telling us that God is a forgetful God. It's telling us that God is an action God. God is an action God. God's never been absent-minded. Look at the passage carefully. God remembered Noah and the animals and the other creatures. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. My Hebrew scholars can read Vayitz Kor. Vayitz Kor. See, I pronounce like Lubbock. Y'all will have to excuse me. But Zakar, we've got right there. Let's see if I can pull it out. There's Zakar, Elohim, at Noah. So God remembers Noah. But Zakar doesn't mean necessarily that he had forgotten something and it just, oh, Karumba comes to his mind. Zakar means that he's going to take an action because of something that's in his mind. Well, you say, well, then why do they translate it remembered? Well, you come up with a better word. I don't have one. You say, well, why don't they put a bunch of words? So God took action because of something he called to mind. Well, that's fine, but that's not a very easy translation. Now you, many of you who read the Old Testament, know Zakar means this because you know the one who talks about God remembering, the prophet who talks about God remembering his people is Zakar Yah, Zechariah, which is God, the abbreviation for, for yod heh vav -Hey, for God, Yah, remembers and that's what Zechariah would say. But the bottom line of this is that we need to know in the midst of our floods, in the midst of our catastrophes, in the midst of tragedies, in the midst of the world around us falling apart, 
that our God not only has it in his mind, but will take action on behalf of his people. That's the moral of the story. Not that, gee, it's happening because God forgot. But rather, in the midst of what you're going through, God hasn't forgotten you. God will take action at the right time, in the right way, for your benefit in an ultimate godly sense. So I want to pray for God to act in our life, please. Father, this is our prayer. You know the storms that each of us face. As you call each of us by name, as you give each of us counsel, Father, and we can look to your word, would you instill in us faith and expectancy? May we wait upon you as you renew our strength. Would you act in our lives, Father? Calm the storm. Deliver us by your might and power and through your holy name. Amen. Next. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend for us and bring it to us that we can hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. So you can do it. There was writing at the time of Moses. But the word was something that most, most people weren't writers. But everybody pretty much could talk and think. And the word was to be in their mouths. This was something they were to say, something they were to remember. But not simply so that they could recite glorious words of God's commands. But rather so they could do it. See, there's a power in obedience. So our little granddaughter, Catherine Ebba, who's just as sweet a gal as, I mean, y'all wish you had a granddaughter like ours. <laughs> Becky and I sat around the other night and said, let's be very objective. Has there ever been a cuter kid? No. <laughs> she is at that age where she'll play hide and seek by doing this with her hands and thinking if she cannot see you, you cannot see her. And squealing with delight when she goes. And for the first time you realize, oh, there she is. <laughs> God's not playing hide and seek with us. This is not a situation where God is saying, um, okay, Climb the Himalayan mountain and look for the wise man and ask him the questions about life. If you can scale the heights, you'll get one question. God's not a hide and seek God. He's a here I am God. I mean, he's so much a here I am God that we take him for granted. Look, I've got to go today to um, New Haven, Connecticut. Tomorrow, I've got to go from New Haven, Connecticut to New York City. On Tuesday from New York City to Washington, D.C. And then on Thursday to Asheville, North Carolina, if it still exists. And I won't get home till Friday. Now, 
that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I want to tell you what it means to me. It means no good Tex-Mex food for five days. <laughs> five. Two, some, one, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Five days. You can bet your sweet bippy I'm going to eat some before I leave. Now, if I'm in Houston for the next five days, I don't need to go eat Mexican food today. I can do it tomorrow. I don't need to eat Mexican food tomorrow. I can do it Tuesday. I can do it Wednesday. I might go five days without eating it because I can eat it anytime I want to. But when it's right there, we can take it for granted. When it's not there, it's like, I want to take advantage of it before, you know. It's like, if you ever, any of you ever go on a diet, you feast before you go on the diet. I'm going to start a diet tomorrow. I better eat the donuts today. I mean, that's the way we are. Now, here's the problem. God is not playing hide and seek. If God told you, you can only read my word one day out of the next year. I mean, I'm, Evelyn Wood doesn't read as fast as I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be putting this thing down. I'm going to be reading through it. But I can read it today. I can read it tonight. I can read it tomorrow. It's not that big a deal. You tend to take it for granted. Because God doesn't play hide and seek. Because God is so ever present. Because God is the God who is seeking you out. We always have a tendency to think, I can do that later. He's not going anywhere. We don't want to be that way. When we are that way, we suffer. We don't become who we can become. We don't see the opportunities that God puts in front of us for what those opportunities are. We don't deal with the issues in our life that we need to deal with to be healthier spiritually and emotionally as well as physically. We don't deal with the issues in our, in our social life or in our work life in ways that are constructive that will build this this, this world in ways for God. We're not tuned in the way we should be. We're not sensitized the way we should be. We're the ones who suffer. But God does stay there ready and saying, here I am. And it's one reason that I'm really jazzed and I ask you to pray please that this book will have an impact that people will choose to say I'm going to read it each day so that they will engage with the word of God prayerfully and thoughtfully in an effort to try and grow before him understand him better and walk faithfully with him so that is my prayer, is that we will pray to find God in our life. Because I promise you, when you do, those storms change radically in the way you see the world. So would you pray with me? Father, we ask you prayerfully and humbly to show yourself to us. And Lord, please... May we direct our attention to you and transform our lives, Father, into a bright, radiant reflection of you, your Son, your love, so that the world will see you better to your glory and in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. I'll see you all next Sunday, I hope, with the woman at the well.